Welcome to Father Nation. This is Jesse Foster, and today on the show we have John Adams. John has a website, dadblogguk.com. In 2014, it was ranked fifth most popular dad blog in the UK. He has two daughters, and he's also written for the Huffington Post. John, thanks for coming on Father Nation, and can you just tell us a little more about yourself? Yeah, thank you. Well, it, it, it's great to be on Father Nation. Um, so, yeah, you, you've already uh, stated I've, I've got two daughters. Um, I've got Helen, who is six, and I have Elizabeth, uh, who is two. Um, live with my wife, Jill, um, on the outskirts of London uh, in, in the UK. Um, I am a stay-at-home dad, so it's my wife uh, who actually works full-time. Um, and sort of has the the, the, the breadwinning role. Um, I started my blog in in 2012, uh, and this has grown to become a, a, a sort of cottage industry for me. It's how I bring some money in into the family, um, which is great because I manage to fit my blogging and sort of a, a little bit of work around my family um, commitments. Um, and as of last night. Um, I am actually a published author. I just just published um, my very first book, uh, A Modern Father and Dad Blogger, which is based on my experiences as a st- both a stay-at-home dad uh, and also a um, uh, pro blogger. And the, f- the focus of dadblogguk.com, is there a specific focus that you generally write about? Um, yes. I, uh, I, I was actually inspired to start it shortly after I became a stay-at-home dad when I um, I noticed uh, a, basically a lot of sexism against fathers that I'd never picked up on before. Um, I noticed uh, employers who were advertising jobs for stay-at-home mums, which in the UK is actually illegal. You, you can't advertise a job on them. Um, on the basis of gender over over here, uh, and I found myself being invited to mother and toddler groups, and I found healthcare professionals sometimes had a very strange way of dealing with me, especially if my wife wasn't with me. Um, and so I initially started blogging to sort of highlight these experiences that I had. Now over time, I have broadened um, the focus of my uh, of my blog, um, so I still write about those those sort of sexist issues that I face but I have brought more generally to write about um, equalities and I write about all aspects of parenting and I do uh, you know product and service reviews and I write a bit about days out and travel and also for the fun of it um, you know just because you're a dad doesn't mean that you're not interested in looking good so I, I've branched out a bit and, and, and also now write a bit about men's style and uh, occasionally a bit of photography and even fiction so um, it's quite broad now but co- the core of what I do is men's issues, parenting and, and fatherhood and, and the issues that, uh, that that men can come across as fathers And your new book is called again Modern Dad? Yeah, um, it's called uh, A Modern Father uh, and Dad Blogger um, It's uh, it's been written it's 18 short chapters Um it's been written in a style so that you can dip in and dip out of it uh, as you wish and it covers a variety of things such as when my daughter started school um, what it's like being a schoolgate dad um, some of the experiences I've had on uh, when my wife gave birth the second time some of the experiences I had on the maternity ward but there are some sort of lot more light-hearted moments as well such as the time my uh, um, uh, I had to make a costume for my daughter's Christmas play and got it very wrong. And the, the, the time that my my daughters both ran riot in the dentist surgery when they were having their teeth checked. So it's it's a bit it's it's a bit of a mixture, but uh, yeah, mostly based on my um, uh, my experiences as a stay at home dad. Well, here at Father Nation, we usually start with a daddy dud, a time when yeah. you've made a mistake in the past. And can you recall a time and also something you learned from it? The daddy dud would probably be misunderstanding um, my my youngest daughter Elizabeth um, she has a very different character to her older sister she's much more vocal um, she will scream and shout a lot more than her younger sister her older sister sorry who was always a lot more placid and 
I think at times I, I've, I've not always reacted as well as I could have done to her when she when she's done that. I mean, I think all the stats have, have had to deal with a with a moment when our children have played up. Um, but I have over time noticed that actually, if she gets emotional, the thing to do is to give her a cuddle, you know, get down to her level. And, and and talk to her. It, it's it's she's not necessarily being a naughty child, you know. It's, it's I almost think it's she's the second child, so she has to fight for attention a bit more. And I I think I've been guilty of misunderstanding that. Is it is it mainly responding out of frustration? Do you think, or do you know? I certainly think that was the case in the past. Um, before she could speak properly, she's now very uh, very verbal. Um, I think she, she, that was part of the problem in that she would get frustrated and she would scream and shout. And it's interesting, she gets older, I'm noticing she's becoming a bit more placid. But yeah, again, I, I think it's largely just she has a completely different temperament to her, to her older sister. No two people are the same, are they? So, you know. And your daughters again are age, age six, you said, and the younger one? Yes, yeah, six and two. So, six and two. Um, Helen is six. As far as as far as today, what would be your biggest struggle with a six year old and a two year old daughter? You know, I think uh, balancing the differing needs of the two children. Um, I, I think uh, Helen, because she's at school, yeah, you know, on a, on a school night, she needs someone to sit down with her and to actually do her homework with her at the end of the school day. Um, and, but you know, she's obviously doesn't want to do that. She wants to go away and play. So you have to sort of placate her and persuade her to do her homework. Whereas little sister um, wants to watch TV or run around or or, or 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 whatever. And it's it's that's always a scenario I think of whenever I'm asked that question. Is it's, it's always a the, the homework scenario trying trying to um, you know deal with the youngest one while dealing with. Uh, with 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 the needs of the oldest one at the at the same time because um you know I think it was just going back to what you're saying a moment ago especially before Abigail was fully verbal it could be very difficult to sort of establish what it was she wanted or needed to do and yet you were having to do stuff for the for the older one for the next school day I think those that that's definitely the biggest challenge I think just I think over time that that will become less of a challenge though as Abigail becomes older she'll understand what her older sister is doing and of course she'll eventually go to school and have the same challenges herself but um for the next couple of years I think it's going to be interesting yeah I, I can relate in some ways with I have I have two kids and we're both real young still I have a two-year-old and a two-month-old now and I feel like sometimes if the mom goes and I, I'm with them, I'm trying to juggle attention with both. And, you know, if a baby's crying and my two-year-old wants attention, and it's hard sometimes to, to try and please them both at the same time. Oh, yes. Yeah, Jesse, I can... I, can, uh, I, I know where you're coming from there. And I, and I think... Uh, congratulations, by the way, on, 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 uh, on, on your relatively new arrival but um i think uh, it'll it'll get more interesting um what what, did, what do you have is it boys and girls or, or yeah i have a i have a son who's two and a half and a daughter who's two months to so the daughter's two months yeah well when when she starts crawling that's when the real fun will begin i think yeah <laughs> i think so well how about uh as far as an aha moment john have you had any ideas as a dad and what were they yeah um i think this is one of those sort of times uh, um, when, when sort of I initially got thinking about this one thing came back to me it was actually not long after the birth of um, our eldest child and I'd read all the parenting books and they all said that um, um, you know a newborn child I forget what it is I think it's the first six weeks they're supposed to only see in black and white um, uh, and, but I noticed the house we lived in at the time it had a front door with a uh, a glass pane with all the panes of glass from different colours and I just noticed that when you had her in your, in your arms she would keep looking over to the to the red patterning in the glass where where some of the glass was stained red um, and it just got me suspicious that she was actually much more light sensitive and colour sensitive than she should have been for her age and I know there was one night because um, my uh, she was a surgical 
uh, birth, um, basically full sips birth. Um, and my wife, uh, Jill, it took her a little while um, to recover. So for the first few nights after we came home, I actually slept downstairs uh, with the baby in her Moses basket next to me so my wife could actually recover and get some rest. And after a few days of this, my wife began to notice just how tired I was because the baby wasn't sleeping and I wasn't getting any sleep. So my wife took baby into the spare room and she tried to sleep with her, but the baby was screaming. It just would not, um, would not rest at all. And I noticed that what she was doing, she was trying to sleep with like a bedside light on. So I said to her, Jill, just turn that light off and see what happens. So I, I joined the two of them in 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 the room and turned the light off and sure enough about two minutes later um, Helen fell asleep that's a very long winded story I'm sorry I do like the sound of my own voice um, but what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say is I think you need to just sometimes you should stand back and just watch your children and just pick up the vibes from them because the only reason I thought about that light was because I'd noticed the way she, her eyes would always drift off and look at that red pane of glass in, in, in the door frame and you know I, th- I think we can as parents sometimes try and sort of force our own agenda on children but actually we should just step back and watch learn from them and listen to what it is they actually want yeah i like that idea of just being careful to observe something that might not be readily apparent and uh yeah that's interesting you say that because the last few weeks my wife has been sleeping in another room with the baby as the baby's been crying a lot each night and she's been sleeping with a light on actually in there Mm. and we've been chalking it up to just maybe it's gas we don't know what it is but maybe it's not gas maybe it could be a a, experiment with a light that might be a good idea for us actually so we'll see she was incredibly light sensitive i mean we actually had to put her in a moses basket get blackout curtains and put a cover uh, just a, a linen cover over the Moses basket if we didn't do that she wouldn't sleep oh, wow. um, it was uh, yeah it was and that was for the first you know sort of six months or year or so she she incredibly light like, sensitive well thinking now to a proud moment can you recall one of your proudest moments well I think one of the most proudest moments as a, as a dad was um, was when um, Helen started school um, it was it was a particular scenario because uh, in the UK kids generally start at school at the age of four. They do one year, which would be more comparable to what you in the US have kindergarten. You know, they 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 wear uniform, but they tend to play games more than do any formal learning. Um, they they do that until the age of five, and then they start in the education system proper. So she's going to school at the age of four. She had been at nursery part time. Or nursery would be what you'd what you'd call a kindergarten, um, and she'd moved to this particular school, but she didn't know anyone there. It's very rare for that to happen these days in the, in the UK. Most kids would move up to a school where they've already been in nursery, but it, it was just an anomaly in her particular year. Um, and I always felt immensely proud that after you know, a few months, she'd gone into this foreign environment that she wasn't used to, and she she actually there was never any resistance to going to school she always went every day quietly went there and my wife and I didn't know this at first I think it was a bit of a lonely time for her because she was quite quiet to begin with it was only later on that her teacher actually told us this um, but by about Christmas time so after about three or four months she'd got settled in she'd got a friendship group and her um, her reading and writing had come on massively and I just always felt incredibly proud of um, Helen for the way she settled into that without knowing anyone uh, in that school it was, it, it was daunting enough being a uh, you know being a stay-at-home dad in the playground not knowing any of the parents so what it must have been like for her at four years old um, I tried to think but yeah she did it she did it she coped and I, I've, I've always felt very proud of her for doing that yeah I'm sure it's, it's fun to see your kids do something and handle something better than you know you, you might be worried about something but that never actually happens you're right and in fact thinking back to her first day at school uh, I mean my, my wife took the day off work so we went together um, and we really weren't sure what was going to happen and she got into line with the kids who were going to become her classmates and she just walked off into that classroom she didn't even look over her shoulder and say goodbye I mean you know I think my, I think my wife and I were felt even feeling quite bereft so, you know, what, 
<laughs> what happened there? <laughs> no tears, no nothing. She's just gone. She's entered entered the school world without uh, uh, without without any any stress at all. It was uh, that 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 was well, another proud moment, I guess. But uh, yeah, she's a good girl. Sean, how about a piece of advice that has made you a better dad? I think it almost goes back to the observation thing. Um, don't try and second guess um, what your children, particularly your young children, need or want to do. Um, I know I was always guilty of thinking, right, today we're going to um, we're going to do some painting or we're going to do some drawing, um, when actually. Uh, what the kids might want to do is they might want to go out for a walk or play in the park so I think you know observe understand their interests and try and let's try and do what they want to do try don't try and do what you think they should be doing I think it it makes for um as a parent you'll have more fun with them you know they'll be more relaxed they'll be doing what they want to do um so they'll be easier to uh, to look after but crucially you would actually have have fun we all lead busy and demanding lives so to actually do something fun that they want to do and makes them laugh and happy um, is, is crucial and important I think yeah I think we often as dads have maybe our agendas of what we think we want to do with them or what they want to do but I guess we have our own little minds as well so you've got to nurture that sense of independence uh, in your children as well and you know one day one way to do that I guess is to within reason of course but is, is, is to let the children you know let, let them do um, uh, what they want and nurture their interests because you're quite right they, everybody's individual even even children well, especially children and should be treated as such as well John do you have one habit that makes you a better dad <laughs> I hate these sorts of questions that imply you're a good parent. Um, <laughs> one, one habit that makes me... Uh, uh, okay, well, I guess there's, there's, there's one thing that I do always like to do is to encourage um, my children uh, to be active. So um, my, my, uh, our eldest child has been doing swimming lessons now for a couple of years. Um, we, we go cycling... Um, with her, you know, every now and again, weekends when mum is at home with the kids, we would always go out for walks. Um, we, we try and nurture that sense of, not so, well, not so much a sense of, but you know, trying to encourage her to be active and to spend time outside and to play and to discover the outside world, um, which I think is, is, is very important. I mean, I, I grew up in a very rural uh, area with, um, but my kids um, have to have to live sort of right on the fringes of London, so um, you know it can be very easy to just spend all your time in town. But it's important to get out to the country and and, and be active, obviously. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd agree with that. I think that uh, you know it's so easy just to spend all your time either in the city or in front of technology that you know many kids don't often go out just outside and experience the world outside. That's right. No, I'm I'm. I'm totally with you there um especially the influence of technology as well is um uh, you know it can be positive one in terms of education but um you don't want to encourage your kids to spend too much time in front of those um tablet computers or or, or notebooks or anything you know you, you, you've got to get them outside is there anything that you use as a resource that has helped you with your kids yes uh i, I i'm gonna stick with technology i'm afraid but um I think other people's blogs and parenting uh, fora that, that are online, you know, if, if I'm looking for activity ideas for the kids or I've got, uh, or I'm looking for maybe recipes to, to, to cook for the kids or um, maybe having a, a you know, wanting, wanting to know sort of whether their educational development is on a par with their peers. Um, you know the, the blogging community is fantastic you know you can google search and you have someone somewhere uh, has written a blog post um, that answers any queries that you may have or may prove very helpful um, and we, we've got a, a we've got a particular um, particularly successful um, 
parenting network over uh, over here called mumsnet.com um despite its name it, it is open to dads although its users are almost exclusively women and you can just search on there and whatever you search for someone somewhere has experienced the issue that you're currently trying to deal with um and uh, yeah I've, I've i've relied on blogs and mumsnet and, and similar um, parenting forum many a time and uh, often yeah th- there's nothing like learning from someone else's first-hand experience i think what was it M- mom it's like m-u-m or m-o-m uh yeah it's uh yeah the the, the, the british way of saying mum m-u-m uh m-u-m-s-n-e-t dot dot com um very rare for someone in the uk to refer to their uh, to their mom as their mum <laughs> sorry sir <laughs> But that'll probably completely confuse your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about one quote on fatherhood? Is there any quotes on fatherhood that you'd like to share with Father Nation? Oh, do you know, I did a search uh, online earlier because uh, this is the one, right. Um, yes, I, I did a search and I've got to be honest, I found many, many quotes and I thought the majority of them were awful. <laughs> but I found one that I thought... Um, summed up the way that I like um, to behave and I, I have to be um, it's from a guy called Dan Pierce uh, who I believe has written a book called Single Dad Laughing um, which I, I have to confess I'm not f- familiar with but um, the quote attributed to him is the greatest mark of a father is how he treats his children when no one is looking um, and I think that's very true I, you know I think some dads, some mums too. You know, you know what happens behind closed doors. I certainly hope that's is, is what happens when they're in public, because we all know that people can be very paranoid about how they're representing themselves and their families in public, and tend to put on a bit of a show, which isn't a thing to do, I don't think. So I th- that that quote sort of sums it up for me. I think. Yeah, I think I, I've I've heard a similar quote to that. I think it was um, something about the mark of a man is pretty much a, a similar quote, but it was about you know being a man and what you know what you do even with no one else seeing, kind of yeah, is about integrity and something like that. Maybe that was maybe that's what inspired Dan uh, with uh, um, with his quote. But yeah. Uh, I like the word you use there, integrity. That's, um, you know, it's not a case of always getting it right. You know, you, you are going to make mistakes. That's fine. That doesn't mean you don't have integrity. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, yeah. Um, I suppose, actually, the, uh, the other thing you've got to accept as a father is you are going to make mistakes. Learn from them. You know, every parent makes mistakes. You, you, you can't avoid that. Um, I think it's very much a case of uh, how, how you deal and how you learn from your mistakes it's how I judge people. It's, it's not the fact they make them, because we all make them. Kind of thinking about that topic and being a stay-at-home dad, do yeah. you think there's any specific things, like mistakes that you've made being a stay-at-home dad that you wouldn't have made maybe if you were a working dad? Or maybe another question, like what kind of, is there any specific advice that you would give just for stay-at-home dads? I think um, stay-at-home, you, you need... As a stay-at-home dad, you need to be confident. You need to accept the fact that you're in a minority. People are going to um, be curious about your uh, position. Um, And the one bit of advice I have for any stay-at-home dad is, as certainly I've found, if I'm dealing with healthcare professionals, education professionals, anyone like that, in the first two minutes of meeting me, uh, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, you know, you, if, you know, I, I can be sort of sat in the, in the, in the, in the chair at the doctor's surgery, sort of almost trying to leap out my sheet seat, and then you know, this thing I've got to say to you here, um, I always say I am the child's main carer. You're dealing with me, not, uh, not, not the mother, because you know, mother, mother's working full time. I'm taking responsibility for this child, um, because. The society, the way society works, people are just um, just expect mums to take on the child caring role, and you do get treated as a second class citizen unless you absolutely make this point from the off that you're the one, the main carer for the child. Um, so that's a bit of advice I'd have for any um, uh, any stay at home dad. 
um, any mistakes uh, I have made um, uh, as a stay at home dad. Oh gosh, that's that. That is an interesting question. I think. I think probably. Uh, yeah, I think actually, bearing in mind what I've just said, I think in the early days I just assumed I would be able to take on the reins of the, being the main child, you know, the, the main child carer, and it would just be easy. That it would just fall into place, and that people would just accept that the fact that I was unfortunately the world isn't like that you have got to accept the fact that you do need to shout that bit louder um, and accept the fact that you are going to be uh, you know you, you are going to be in a minority you will very often um, find yourself in a you know in a soft play centre or something and be the only guy there especially if it's um, during the working week um, so it can be a bit of a lonely experience so um, you need to be prepared for that so it sounds like one of a one of a key key pieces of advice for a stay at home dad is to be, you know, proactive and maybe vocal. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I did when Helen started school was I actually made a point of volunteering in the school uh, one morning a week. Um, unfortunately, you know, personal circumstances have changed. I can't do it any longer. But part of the reason I did that was, um, you know, to put a, a you know, put a stake in the ground really um so but you know the education staff knew that what you know that i was there i was just a stay-at-home dad at, um and i wanted to get to know the school and which was the main, another very large reason for doing it i wanted to get used to the education system and see what actually happened in those classrooms but also you know, the other parents saw me you know volunteering so they knew that i was um yeah they, they got, got got to know my position as did the staff of the school um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I sort of agree with the, with, with the point you were making there. If you were to think of hypo- hypothetically uh, taking custody of a twelve-year-old orphan, what do you think you might do the first day? I would actually do very little in the first day. I would show them where they'd be living. I would ask them what they wanted to do, uh, and I would go with that. I, I would aim to do. You know, not much more than have a meal, let them open up slowly to me, tell them what they want to tell me, uh, and and really go um, go very gently. I I wouldn't be planning to do much at all, and I would be preparing. Uh, you know, a twelve year old orphan is 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 going to have um is going to have some needs and some special issues that are going to need attending to. So you're going to have to understand what they are. Um, and the child is you know, probably going to have some emotions they're going to want to express so you need to be prepared for that I think yeah some, sometimes I, less might be more uh, yeah I, 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 in that scenario I think so I, I, I think you could very easily overwhelm uh, a child in those circumstances and I would just want to sit back let, um, let, let the child uh, uh, figure out you know and at least find out and, and realize they were now in a safe environment yeah you can always you can always do stuff later exactly yeah there's plenty of time to go to the to the play park or whatever i'll be going very slowly in those circumstances and uh, yeah i i would be calling on as much professional help as um as was necessary i think as well john can you remind father nation again um how they could get in contact with you one last time yes yeah, certainly um well the the the, the blog is um dadblogukcom you'll find me on twitter uh, and instagram um both on at dadblog uk um you'll find me on uh, um linkedin and google plus as well or you can always email me um uh, with you, the best email address is uh this dadblogukcom uk at gmail dot com and again, if they want to do a quick Amazon sh- search for book title, yeah, certainly it's um, it's a modern father and dad blogger um, by John Adams. Um, it's available in paperback uh, and also Kindle edition. Thank you, John, for coming on Father Nation. And before you go, what is one final takeaway you would give to Father Nation? It would be my my blog's uh, strapline. Actually, it's uh, it. It's a bit hard hitting, but I would say gestation and lactation are the only things that you cannot do as a father. 
um, have the confidence, believe in yourself. There is nothing that you cannot do uh, as a dad with your children apart from those two things. Um, so do it and do it the best you can. Hey, it's Al Cole, host of the syndicated talk show People of Distinction, throwing the spotlight on another one of my guests of distinction. This time, taking an awesome step forward to great fatherhood in our world with the outstanding work of Jesse Foster. Jesse is the creator of the Father Nation podcast, a show to showcase dads and their committed professional work to help other dads, too. Jesse interviews fathers from all over the world to learn from them their deep, dedicated, and sometimes even playful experiences as dads so that they can share their amazing wisdom with you. In Jesse's own words, let the journeys of dads featured on my Father Nation podcast illuminate your path as a dad, too. What could be better? Hey, hey. And if you like the message, I want you to run to this website and support Jesse's Father Father Nation podcast and the great work of all dads worldwide. Go to fathernation.com. That's www.fathernation.com. And remember, hearing about the successes, the aha moments, and even the occasional failures of other dads can help you avoid their mistakes, emulate their successful strategies, and take action yourself to become a better dad. So again, run to this website, fathernation.com. That's www.fathernation.com. Jesse Foster's Father Nation podcast, helping you to imprint the kind of legacy in your family that you desire to create. <laughs>